Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So students, welcome back to developmental biology course. Um, for this session, this is going to be our uh, last class. So till the previous class, we discussed about the mechanisms by which uh, phenotypic variations can be generated. And through those mechanisms, we learnt uh, that, uh, you know, the by uh, independently varying the developmental modules as well as the genetic module like you know the dominant thing we discussed to primarily is enhancer um, how a uh, variety of phenotypes can be generated from in, in a common lineage. So, so through that we kind of got the impression that uh, you know, you know, there is no limit to the uh, varieties of phenotypes one can actually generate. But the reality is not that. So, although we have really a remarkable diversity among biological um, uh, structures, like if you look at organisms around you, um, you know, there is remarkable diversity. Uh, so much so that initially it was hard to believe there is actually a unity they all came from a common ancestor. But if you look closely, you will realize there seems to be limits to the uh, bob, uh, body structure variations that can be generated. Okay, So you do not find any organism which instead of using uh, limb movement uh, uses a, uh, you know, like a bicycle, a wheel to move around you do not see any organism that has a wheel like structure, a moving organ. Okay, But if you look at the human inventions, almost all of them seem to depend on circular motion. Okay, So, so when you think in these lines, you will soon realize there seems to be uh, limits to the types of structures, shapes uh, that um, biology can create. Okay, and those limits are actually imposed by the body plans originally laid out. So, so the mechanisms that we went through, uh, we realize is going to impose certain restrictions. So, that is going to be our current theme, okay, developmental constraints. And these constraints, therefore, are going to limit the kind of variations possible, and that in turn is going to limit the variety from which natural selection can choose. Okay, so therefore, the ev evolutionary adaptation therefore is going to be uh, restrained by the developmental possibilities that exist. Okay, so and we are going to look at what are those constraints and how do they impact um, organism development. So the, the first constraint we are thinking about uh, is the physical constraints. You know, for example, the laws of uh, physics and chemistry can't be disobeyed. The molecules diffuse only at a certain rate and no, no faster than that. And similarly, the movement of uh, fluids uh, against gravity or towards gravity, again, they will be uh, controlled by the laws of fluid dynamics. And physical support, uh, what weight can be borne by what kind of a structure and so on. And one of the very easy thing to see is just uh, uh, written here, you know, um, blood can't circulate to a rotating organ. Just imagine, uh, you know, setting up a plumbing work for something that is rotating all the time. Okay, how do you send fluid to it and how do you take fluid out from it? And uh, think about a mosquito that is six foot tall. Okay, or in the body plan of leech making it 25 feet long. Okay, so these are not going to be readily permitted by the basic body plans. And these are the physical constraints here. Okay, these are determined by the laws of physics. Okay, so 
So, we will look at uh, more such uh, constraints as we go along. So, the next one we are going to look at are morphogenetic constraints. Okay. So, morphogenetic uh, constraints uh, before that let us uh, recap what is a morphogen. So, morphogen is a molecule whose concentration a particular concentration determines what kind of genes it will turn on or turn off. At a different concentration it will regulate a different set of genes. Okay. So, the concentration is critical here. Okay. So, the morphogen usually forms a concentration gradient and in that field of that gradient you have a different uh, concentration levels, different genes being regulated. Okay. So, that is what we call as a morphogenetic field. So, uh, so that itself provides uh, certain constraints because the rate of production of that molecule, the rate of the diffusion of it and uh, the effect of inhibitors that would uh, inhibit its production or its activity all of that are going to uh, regulate you know set up uh, a, a, a framework that is going to govern how a morphogenetic field is going to behave. And due to that uh, the kind of structures that that morphogenetic field will uh, permit will be limited. Okay. Um, for example, you know yesterday I was sort of alluding to it. Uh, if you look at your uh, foot, the middle toe is longer than the one towards the end from the bigger, biggest one. Okay. So, you never find uh, an organism where the middle one is shorter. So, that is probably uh, is governed by the morphogenetic field that sets up the, you know, the, the growth rate of uh, th those toes. And you see similar things, many examples like that. And before we go into looking at actual example, uh, let us look at a model, okay, a, ma a mathematical model that sort of explains uh, the boundary conditions of a morphogenetic field. Okay. So, a, a, a famous model uh, that explains this is called a reaction diffusion model proposed by Alan Turing. Um, so, he is a computational biologist, but he was um, interested in many areas and his major contribution to biology is this reaction diffusion model. So, so this model actually explains how two homogeneous chemicals uh, in a solution would behave uh, given certain properties um, of them. Okay. So, let us take two molecules here, one we are going to call as P and another one we are going to call as S. Okay. And uh, let us say P is an activator of a certain phenotype and then uh, this P has a certain rate of diffusion. Okay. So, it diffuses uh, from its point of production. Yeah, if you see this uh, greenish um, graph here. So, it, it diffuses uh, rather slowly compared to another molecule called S. Okay, it diffuses rapidly and as a result uh, it forms a shallow peak compared to this. And let us assume P activates its own production as well as the production of S which is an inhibitor of P. So, if, if these were the properties of uh, these two molecules, now what actually happens over a period of time. Okay. So, uh, let us slowly go through this. So, if P is going to produce S, so wherever P is going to raise, S is also going to raise, but then S is going to diffuse faster and by going away from the P peak and having the property of suppressing P, then at a distances little bit around the P peak, it is going to prevent the P, further P peaks from forming because this S concentration would suppress P coming. So, as a result smaller shoulder peaks around the uh, initial mound of P does not happen due to this property of S. So, if you leave this homogeneous solution of P and S for some time and based on their diffusion rate and their uh, 
effect on each other, you will end up generating this sort of a uh, pattern. So initially you will have multiple P's because P produces its own, you know, it's an auto activator and therefore where there is a P then you get more P, but then you will get S as well. Uh, initially if S is uniformly distributed, then uh, S will uniformly suppress and that would lead to this sort of a change in S because P, wherever P is more, S is going to increase. But then that S is going to diffuse quite rapidly suppressing uh, these smaller P peaks and that would eventually lead to this sort of a condition. And if this is going to be the way this morphogenetic field is going to be set up, then it only a certain type of development is going to be possible. E every possible variation is not going to be accommodated by this kind of property of this morphogens. Okay? This is just one example of a model. This need not uh, and does not cover all the morphogens. This is just an example to uh, make us understand how there will be limitations in the morphogenetic field. Okay. And this sort of a, a, you know constraint pro provided by a morphogenetic field will limit the kind of structures that are variations in the structures that are possible. Okay. So, so for example, here um, th this reaction diffusion model was uh, famously used to explain, you know, the, the, you know, if you look at your teeth, let us take one of them, a molar uh, tooth on the surface, you know, where you are biting, uh, this is embedded in the bone and this is what is visible and on top of it, you know. Uh, you have these um, shapes and these are called cusps, okay. And this pattern of th this each peak like mound like shape is what is a cusp and the pattern of this cusp is determined by a morphogenetic field which actually follows the reaction diffusion model. And therefore, from the reaction diffusion model of uh, how the morphogens that are ultimately responsible for this cusp pattern, you can actually predict what kind of cusp pattern will form. And that is what is uh, explained by looking at the uh, cusp pattern in mouse and another rodent wall. Okay. In these two, the initial um, uh, production of this FGF4 and uh, Sonic Hedgehog and their uh, diffusion and their ability to inhibit uh, another uh, molecule, um, you know, which is uh, none other than another BMP. Okay. So, based on that, uh, scientists were able to predict uh, a little ahead of the cusp pattern by looking at the gene expression. Like for example, gene expression pattern of embryonic day 14. Uh, helps you to predict what would be the cusp pattern on embryonic day 15. Okay. And, sim and this could be done for both these organisms. And the expression pattern of these two uh, and the variation in that between these two organisms help us explain the final cusp pattern variation uh, in these two organisms. Okay. So, this is the gene expression pattern. Uh, FGF is one color and uh, SHS is the other color and based on their expression pattern you can predict what is going to like kind of this expression tells you this structure is going to come and these two tell you that here you are going to have the cusps coming and so on. So, uh, and this sort of a structure formation you see it here okay. and then this variation ends up becoming these two and, and so on. And, and here in the original Turing's model, all that they needed to incorporate is that as the development progresses, the rate of diffusion of the two molecules do not remain the same, okay, because extracellular matrix forms and that is going to affect that. And that, so a correction factor for such changing behavior of extracellular matrix, which changes the diffusion. Uh, had to be incorporated. And another thing was the, um, the binding strength of the inhibitor uh, varies again. And by changing these two, scientists were correctly able to predict um, the uh, cusp pattern in the molar teeth of these rodents.
Um, so here um, is the way the reaction actually works. So BMP4 promotes the epithelial proliferation. This is the cell that's going to deposit the enamel. Uh, whereas this FGF8 uh, promotes the um, underneath uh, mesenchymal cells, which actually forms the dentin, the inner side, the, the layer below or in, uh, towards the inside from the enamel side. Okay. And these two have this relationship. BMP4, in addition to promoting its own expression, it is also going to promote the expression of a gene that is ultimately going to produce the FGF. So this is like our P in the reaction diffusion model and this is like the S. And the S there uh, as in the model here again via this molecule ends up inhibiting this. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, this is the kind of relationship that is molecularly determined and then now when you use those molecular parameters in the reaction diffusion model, then you are able to predict. So, this is the predicted uh, cusp pattern based on this uh, relationship and these um, phenotypes induced by these two molecules. So, this is the predicted pattern uh, and this is the observed pattern. You know, they are more or less same. And this is for wall, the other rodent. Again, this is the predicted pattern and this is the actually observed one. So, slight alterations in the rate of BMP diffusion and the binding to inhibitors can reproduce the difference between these two. All you need to do is that, just the rate of diffusion because of variations in the extracellular matrix and the, uh, you know, the allelic difference coming into play at the level of fine binding affinity of these inhibitors and these two could explain the difference between the two and that could be predicted based on the expression pattern uh, observed at an earlier stage. And uh, this, could, this also has been useful in tracing the, you know, evolutionary uh, history of uh, tooth development uh, in, in, in among horses. So, that, that is shown in this. So, here what you are actually uh, seeing is a summary of the previous one. So, this, uh, this acts like a motor, okay. Activator activates itself and activates inhibitor and inhibitor inhibits this. And this relationship which acts like a motor controls these two tissue formation. Okay, the rate of proliferation of these two are regulated by these structures, uh, these genes or molecules regulating themselves. Okay. And um, so, by looking at the expression pattern of uh, an ancient uh, horse like this Loxolophus uh, and by uh, looking, by inducing a certain changes in this uh, BMP and SHS people are able to predict how this structure would form. Uh, you know, th this is what you see in the modern horse. And by looking at the concentrations in this kind of a structure and predicting using reaction diffusion model, you exactly explain how this fourth cusp forms in the modern horses, how this could have come from this. So, so the, this, this is uh, the reaction diffusion model which is actually, um, you know, proposed to explain morphogenetic field. But here we are seeing in the context of how this is going to have certain restraints and therefore only a certain limited variations in the structures that are possible. And this is uh, the re reason why you do not get um, uh, the middle toe or the middle finger in your hand being shorter because the morphogenetic field that sets up the field is, is such that, that the genes expressed uh, only in a certain way and that ends up producing only these uh, lengths of the toes or fingers. Okay. The, the principles that govern the diffusion here ends up governing the length of the fingers. So, uh, so, the, so we saw two of them, the physical constraints, like you can't break the physical laws 
and uh, like for example, a circulatory organ cannot be supplied with blood. And then we saw that the, you know, the morphogenetic field will have certain, uh, you know, uh, principles that govern them and therefore that is going to impose certain constraints on development. The third we are going to look at are the evolutionary history of a, a certain development, okay, a certain body plan that formed in one certain way now can't be totally reworked, okay, because evolution works on what already exists. You are not going to go back to the drawing board, so to say, and then uh, redraw the whole thing from scratch. That does not happen in biology, okay. So, this is one of the strongest evidences that uh, people put forth to, uh, you know, prove that uh, modern day organisms actually came from ancestors and therefore, the organisms are not perfect machines, okay. Um, so, there are a lot of examples. Um, so, I, I would urge you to read a book by Richard Dawkins called The Greatest Show on Earth. You know, in that book, he uh, lays out a large number of uh, examples to illustrate this point, okay. Uh, how the, our body is imperfect from, from an engineer's point of view of de designing and building an efficient machine, okay. So, so that evolutionary history of a certain body plan uh, lays certain con uh, constraints and that is what we call phyletic constraints. So, the phyletic word coming from phylogeny, okay. So, the evolutionary history that is the phylogeny and um, uh, so, the, so the, that is what the, 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 that is what is the evolutionary history is about. So, so let us look at some of the examples uh, like for example, notochord in vertebrate uh, like us is only a transient organ in the embryo, uh, but nevertheless we are dependent on it for that particular stage of embryonic development to instruct the neural crest formation as well as the somites, uh, the sclerotome, you need the uh, in notochord structure. But if you look at the evolutionary history, this particular way of making neural crest and somites formed in uh, earlier chordates where the notochord actually exists in the adult and has a function. And due to that evolutionary uh, origin, although we do not need a notochord in the adult, it still remains uh, during uh, as a organ, uh, important crucial structure in our embryonic development. And uh, another interesting example is lack of variation among marsupial limbs, okay. If you look at other, um, uh, you know, vertebrates, like if you look at eutherian mammals, you see variations like you have hand, bat, wing, then you have flipper and then you have claws, all those variations. And that kind of variation has not happened in marsupial limbs, uh, primarily because the first thing the fetus needs to do once it comes out is to find a way to crawl and climb on into the pouch of the mother. So, that means that limb development to be able to grasp and crawl has to happen first and there you cannot experiment, okay, because life depends on it, its safety depends on that. And as a result, those limbs did not vary much over a long period of time, okay. So, that is, uh, um, you know, a lack of variation. And then uh, constraints on adult uh, alternative body plans by Peleotropic nature, okay. So, that is another example. So, initially you have a molecule, let, let us say a protein, the segment polarity genes, you take any of them. So, they were initially there to identify a particular segment, provide segmental identity. But then later on, that molecule has been uh, adopted um, for uh, multiple functions, okay. You are free for some time, okay. You can do, why do not you do this work as well, okay. Um, and once a molecule is involved in doing multiple works, then you just cannot get rid of it because then the whole thing is going to die. It becomes so vital. It is going to have multiple phenotypic uh, problems. And that peleotropy, uh, peleotropic nature of certain molecules uh, end up constraining variations that are possible. For example, in the insect segmentation, okay. Uh, 
a, a, a good example uh, in vertebrates is the, the Hox gene, a particular Hox gene that specifies the cervical uh, vertebrae. So, we saw that it is uh, the cer uh, cervical vertebrae are more in chick than in mouse, right. So, why can't we have more uh, in uh, you know our own neck, you know why can't I have a longer neck, all right. So, that is because this Hox gene that specifies the cervical vertebrae got involved in regulating stem cell proliferation as well. So, if I want more of it to make more longer neck, then I will end up uh, promoting uh, an unnecessary excessive proliferation somewhere causing a tumor. And not surprisingly, this is not simply a prediction for an argument, uh, this has been proven to be true in nature, okay. That is shown in um, next slide and then we will come back to this phylotypic uh, stage as well, that is another uh, important constraint. So, here if you look at it, so this particular child um, uh, you know as an infant had uh, one extra pair of uh, cervical uh, you know uh, vertebra and as uh, th the same child ended up having uh, you know embryonic tumors and uh, died. And now when people looked at uh, the embryonic tumors, okay, the early uh, cancers and then look at uh, how many of them or what fraction of those uh, children who had embryonic cancer also had this cervi extra cervical bone and that is what is shown here. In the general population, the percentage of uh, patients with embryonic tumor who also had the cervical uh, ribs, you know the extra ribs, you end up finding uh, you know a very small percentage probably you know 1 or 2 percent. But then if you look at the ones who had um, you know uh, these tumors, uh, neuroblastoma, brain tumor, leukemia and so on and if you look at the total childhood cancer, uh, in all of them the uh, the, uh, the frequency of occurrence of this extra rib was lot higher compared to this general uh, healthy population. So, indicating a direct connection between this extra rib and then um, the cancer. That is because the Hox gene that is involved in this extra rib formation is also involved in stem cell proliferation. So, due to this, so by having this you are going to have a fatal condition. So, therefore, this, this extra cervix producing uh, vertebra producing mutation is not going to be tolerated in evolution. So, this is a, uh, a what you call as phyletic constraint, okay. So, the other one is this phylotypic uh, uh, you know constraint. So, we are going to look at it uh, in some detail, okay. So, that is shown here. So, uh, you know, we, we would intuitively think that the early embryonic development probably is not very flexible and that is probably, um, you know, very rigid. You, you just cannot have any alteration and that is going to mess up the entire embryo. But surprisingly, that does not seem to be the case, okay. So, many, uh, you know, uh, members of this uh, su subphylum uh, vertebra vertebrata can actually go through variety of cleavage and castration patterns. You know like for example, I told uh, while we were talking about the early mammalian development that mammalian embryo is unique in many ways. You know I told uh, elaborately about this uh, rotational cleavage, uh, asynchronous division, blastocele formation, compaction and so on. All of that they do not happen in other ones because you know I told that is hallmark of uh, mammals like this elephant here. So, by a variety of these early embryonic steps like cleavage and gasolation, they all come to a certain um, uh, you know a, a common structure during embryonic development. In this particular case is the little late uh, later stage of neurula stage which is called as pharyngula, okay. So, th this pharyngula stage uh, 
all these uh, we, we, we members of this subphylum vertebrata they all produce the structure and such a structure is called the phylotypic stage meaning this structure is typical of this phylum okay so that is why it is called phylotypic stage so this stage of embryonic development typifies this phylum it is unique to this phylum regardless of um, other subgroups within this phylum okay and that kind of as embryonic stage we call as phylotypic stage and laying down that body plan once done then that seems to be fixed it can only generate these varieties and you can't meddle with it once you have come here then you are going to be a vertebrate you, you're not going to be something else and that is the bottleneck created by the phylotypic stage so this is another example of uh, phylotic uh, constraint okay and this is explained in some detail in the next slide how this may be so uh, like for example the, during the early embryonic development um, you, you really do not have whole lot of uh, inductive uh, you know activities and even those that exist are global affecting the whole embryo and that is primarily in setting up the uh, axis uh, anterior posterior or dorsal ventral axis uh, setting up and small variations in those morphogenetic field are usually accommodated okay uh, but when you get to the later stage um, you have got an uh, local developmental modules and any the change or alteration in those um, inductive events you have a lot of inductive events as shown by these arrows here and these are local interaction for example you know optic vesicle and lens uh, the in the in induction signal uh, you know that's happening here if it is messed up only the eye will not develop but not the rest so here the interactions are within the modules and therefore only a local structure will be affected but if you look at the phylotypic stage you have the modules interacting okay induction happens here but here these inductions are among the modules themselves not within a module meaning here a, a, a module telling another module where to form a certain organ you know where to make the kidney where to make the heart where to make the eye and so on and there you can't afford to mess up if you if, if one module uh, sets up its uh, shop and goes ahead making an organ in the wrong place then that is not going to be a functional adult and due to that the phylotypic uh, stage that particular structure that needs to be formed to make a vertebrate imposes constraints about how many varieties are possible in that basic body plan and that is uh, the that is an ex uh, example of a phyletic uh, constraint ok fine so these are um, examples and the types of um, uh, constraints that uh, stems from the developmental mechanisms ok um, uh, 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 of certain body plants so now what we are going to do is we are going to move to a different theme uh, where we are going to look at um, how sometimes uh, for a given genotype okay you could have uh, a range of phenotype for a given genotype okay and within that range you may select a certain position L let's say I arbitrarily say for a genotype uh, you could have um, skin color ranging from uh, black to albino let us say for the same genotype and whether it is going to be black or um, uh, albino is dependent on environment okay that sort of a situation you call as polypheno polyphenism making multiple multiple phenotypes for a given genotype okay and this indicates a certain flexibility in the development F for the same molecules uh, everything for the same uh, you know uh, nuts and bolts uh, 
there seems to be a flexibility, a stretchability in the phenotype. And as a result, we call this as developmental plasticity, okay, which is development of alternative phenotypes for a given genotype and the within that uh, multiple phenotypes, what is going to be decided is actually dependent on an environment. Okay, so the, here I have introduced two important words, you know, developmental plasticity and polyphenism. Okay, here the important thing is genotype is identical, there are no allelic variations, there are no changes in enhancer or anything. The DNA sequence is identical, but phenotype has certain range. Okay, or alternative forms. It may not be range always, it sometimes it is alternative forms. And those alternative forms where each form is determined by a given environment is what we call as polyphenism. And this ability in development is what we call as developmental plasticity. Okay. And this phenomena again contributes to selectable variations. Okay. So, you need to have variations in the population where you can select and how to produce those selectable variation. We already have learned so far all controlled by changing the uh, you know DNA sequence. Now, we are looking at a situation where we are not touching the uh, DNA, but then we recognize that multiple phenotypes may be allowed by that genotype and which phenotype is going to be selected is probably uh, going to happen in a non-genotype dependent manner and that is why this word epigenetic variation. And do such variations exist and do they help evolution? That is what is going to be our topic now. So, so, the, the, this uh, plasticity lends itself to such a selection and that is what we call as epigenetic inheritance. So, this sort of kind of sub ends up somewhat supporting uh, Lamarckian idea, but the, the, it is not really. Lamarckian idea talks about use disuse, um, but we are not talking about use disuse here. You know, it, uh, Lamarckian idea is clearly wrong that, for example, if someone is a bodybuilder, uh, there is no guarantee that that person's child is going to be very muscular. Or uh, as the textbook says, uh, accident victims who lost a limb can rest assured that their children will be born with normal limbs. Okay? So, that is where Lamarckian comes. Here what we are talking about is if an environment induced certain changes in the somatic cells and suppose if those factors that are originally made in the soma could find a way into the germline, will not it get inherited? They do get inherited and that is what we call as epigenetic inheritance systems. And we will see examples of that, then we, uh, it will all become clearer. Okay, here is one example. Um, so, here you have these uh, locusts. Okay. So, this is a solitary locust, uh, greenish, and um, it, uh, it, it, it just forages on its own, it, it never becomes a group. Okay. So, it is solitary uh, uh, existence and it produces progeny which are again going to be solitary, they are not going to be gregarious. Whereas, under certain conditions if they end up being in large population, uh, they end up producing gregarious progeny, although the genotype is the same. And this gregarious progeny, even when it is not in group in, in a solitary condition, it ends up producing gre uh, gregarious progeny. Okay. So, in earlier generations environmental experience here being in a crowded population uh, produces an inheritable um, property, okay, characteristic. So, a, a subsequent generation that is not in a crowd uh, also ends up producing this gregarious variety. Okay. 
So, that, that is an example of uh, polyphenism. So, here these two are two different phenotypes possible for the same genotype and the, it is uh, it apparently depends on uh, a, a chemical produced by the OV duct and it deposited in the foam that protects the egg. Okay. And when you take that gregarious locust uh, the foam and coat it on that produced by the solitary and the solitary one ends up producing gregarious. Okay. And if you wash off that foam then this ends up producing solitary. And if you reapply after washing then again it becomes gregarious. So, this is how people showed that it is actually a chemical that is coating the egg ended up deciding uh, this phenotype. So, the, the primary thing is um, after its original experience in a subsequent generation even when that experience is not there it again produces the same phenotype. So, that is how it becomes epigenetic inheritance, it is inherited, the initial stimulus is not required anymore. Okay. So, now what are the mechanisms by this uh, by which this happens? There are three different mechanisms and that is what we are going to see in the subsequent slides. So, the first one we are going to talk about is called epi alleles. So, we know alleles you know having uh, differences in the DNA sequence for a given locus you know, on the chromosome. Okay. For a given genetic locus you have some variations in the DNA sequence without altering the total uh, property of the encoded protein or the RNA and that we call as alleles. right? Epi alleles are again um, variations but here not on the DNA sequence but on the chromatin structure itself. Uh, one chromatin structure you can readily think of is DNA methylation. I, is there going to be that a certain part of that uh, gene or uh, let us say promoter is it methylated or, or not methylated or is it hypermethylated etcetera. And uh, if that methylation pattern can be passed on let us say a certain environmental influence influ uh, caused that kind of methylation on a certain somatic cell in, in one particular generation. If it can actually impact on the chromatin of the germline then it can actually go to the next generation. So, it does not matter whether the variation is in the DNA sequence or the chromatin structure if either of them can actually pass down through the germline and if they are going to have an impact on the gene it is going to have an impact. Okay, so, that is not going to be distinguished by whether the variation is on the chromatin structure on the or the DNA sequence itself. So, when you have that kind of a variation based on chromatin structure you call epi alleles. So, here is an example of epi allele. So, so here you have this normal uh, flowering pattern uh, in, uh, in a certain toad flax and this is unmethylated version and if it is the this particular gene uh, uh, if this particular gene is hypermethylated then it produces this sort of a flowering pattern and this can be stably inherited. So, if you look at the sequence you will not find variation but if you look at the methylation then you will find this allele is hypermethylated and this allele is not and both are stably inherited. And this is one mechanism by which you have epigenetic inheritance. And this is originally determined by an environment that actually induced this methylation. And there are many many examples in the animal uh, you know kingdom as well. And uh, so, we will just uh, uh, in the interest of time we will only look at one example. So, Agouti it describes this um, pattern you know grayish white is sort of this uh, fur pigmentation pattern is what is agouti a certain way of a uh, certain pigment pattern is agouti phenotype. And this is often connected with obesity as well. Okay. So, a, a mother that is fed in a diet poor which is poor in methyl donors then it ends up not developing that fur pattern and also it becomes obese. 
okay the, the availability of methyl donors in the mother's diet okay it ends up affecting the progeny and not just that that progeny when it is going to give progeny that is the grand uh, offspring generation there again you are going to have this effect on the other hand if you have proper uh, you know diet rich in methyl donor then it develops a normal phenotype so here here the in one generation an environmental influence meaning uh, in this particular example it is the diet whether it has whether it is rich in methyl donor or poor in methyl donor that determined whether it is going to be obese and also have this uh, fur pigmentation pattern or it is going to be wild type and this gets stably inherited in subsequent generations as well okay and uh, so th this is another example of epi allele so the second one we are going to look at is called symbiont variation so here it, it is the symbiosis okay so meaning one organism uh, setting up a relationship with another organism in which both of them mutually benefit. A good example uh, is uh, our uh, the intestinal microflora. You know, there are a lot of bacterial species that colonize our um, digestive tract. And these being bacteria, they can readily uh, generate variations and if each of those variations are going to have an influence on the host organisms uh, phenotype then you can easily generate lot of variations um, in the host okay so that is the symbiont uh, variation based example of epigenetic inheritance so let us look at it in some detail so they actually can uh, readily cause these variations because of these four characteristics of the bacterial population uh, one of them can be uh, relative abundance. You could have, uh, let, let us take bacterial population A, bacteria, bacterial population B. Uh, let us assume only there are two populations in our gut. Now, population A to B ratio can vary. Maybe initially 50-50, you know, in equal fraction. But then, due to changes in the food or environment, you could end up having variation in them. And A being more or B being more can readily happen and that could readily uh, affect the uh, phenotype uh, that is selectable at the level of the host. And you can easily introduce another bacteria. You are not going to experiment by changing the uh, genetic uh, makeup of the host uh, that is going to be requiring lot more effort and time than introducing one more uh, my, uh, you know, microbe into the symbiotic population. So that, that is another uh, feature of bacterial population. And the third is um, they can easily undergo mutations. Okay, so the host cannot undergo genetic mutation and generate a phenotype that is selectable at the given generation itself. Okay, you need to go through several generations um, of that host. But instead, these having shorter uh, life cycle, uh, generation time, and as well as uh, in very large numbers, they can undergo mutations. You know, they, they, they are not going to have two alleles to, you know, uh, to mutate both of them, etc. They can easily generate mutation through recombination and random mutation. And these changes can occur more rapidly in microbes. And uh, lastly, uh, and equally importantly, horizontal gene transfer happens among bacterial species. Okay, in prokaryotes, it readily happens, like from one species, genetic transfer to another species, which is, does not readily happen in uh, vertebrates like us. Okay, from one vertebrate having a transfer to another vertebrate that does not readily happen but among bacterial species this readily happens okay um, and due to these uh, uh, characteristics of bacterial species 
the symbiotic symbionts variation can readily happen and that could cause selectable variations in terms of the host itself. So, one example is uh, shown in this slide. Uh, le, le, the, so, here we are actually seeing an interplay between the host genotype and the uh, bacterial composition of its uh, inter digestive tract. Okay. So, here is the, the gene here is the leptin. So, here you have this is the wild type mouse and this is the leptin mutant one. So, you find that this is uh, obese. Okay, that is uh, caused in a complicated way by leptin mutation as well as the gut microflora. So, this has a certain bacterial composition, but this has a different bacterial composition, which is actually uh, very efficient, uh, more efficient than this in releasing calorie from the food and as a result, it does not really need whole lot of food to put on weight compared to this. And what influenced this particular bacterial composition? That is by the leptin gene. So, the host genotype influenced the bacterial composition in the gut, which in turn influenced the host's phenotype. Okay. Now, if you take this bacterial uh, mix from the uh, leptin mutant mice and introduce into uh, wild type mice and their progeny end up putting on weight although they do not carry the leptin mutation. So, this bacterial composition that is affected in one generation, one generation by the genotype actually end up causing the phenotype in subsequent generations even in a wild type genotype. Okay. So, this is a good example of a symbiont, uh, symbiont variation. So, so, here what we actually are seeing is that the composition of the symbiont and the host genotype together generate a host phenotype. Okay. So, so, so the, 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 that, that is why I said this is a sort of a complicated situation where you have symbiont composition varying in a manner that is dependent on the host genotype. All right. So, we have seen epi alleles exam two examples we saw and then we saw how symbionts can readily influence variation and then we saw one example. The last one in this uh, the epigenetic inheritance system we are going to see is called genetic assimilation. So, this will look little complicated as we go along, but I will tell you in a nutshell uh, what it actually means is in the previous examples we saw that an environmental uh, factor that induced a certain phenotype allowed by that developmental plasticity uh, gets inherited in subsequent generations that is what I said. Okay, but I did not say for how long. So, suppose such a uh, you know uh, increased frequency of a certain phenotype okay, among the alternative phenotypes that is possible eventually gets taken over by the genotype and becomes stably passed on um, without requiring the environmental trigger again you call that as genetically assimilated. Okay, that is what is genetic assimilation. So, a, a phenotype that is thrown out uh, by an environmental trigger eventually gets genetically assimilated. It no longer requires that uh, environmental trigger and that is what you call as genetic assimilation. So, you will be wondering and greatly confused. Um, how this ends up actually creating variation in the genotype. Without that, how do I inherit it, uh, you know, with, without the trigger anymore. Okay. So, that, that will be the major cause of the confusion or inability to comprehend this. But the reality is actually the, it is actually in a population where you have multiple alleles existing in certain frequency but the 
range of the phenotype not being visible okay due to the lack, lack of that uh, environmental trigger that is required once triggered and if it is repeatedly triggered for some time ends up increasing the frequency of certain allele okay that is how actually it becomes genetically assimilated so when we see the examples it will become uh, clearer so so here essentially what, what, what we are talking about is initially the phenotype seen and later it becomes genotype opposite of what we have understood so far phenotype precedes genotype so let us see the examples then this will become very uh, clear so uh, here is an example of um, a fly population the drosophila in an experimental population in the lab uh, a scientist noticed that when you expose their embryos development at a certain stage to ether uh, they end up producing um, this um, you know bithorax mutant like phenotype so uh, end up making four wings so the dro drosophila is a dipteran meaning it produces two wings only the middle thoracic segment produces uh, in this particular image the uh, drawing here this regular wings are cut to expose this uh, segment but this uh, the third thoracic segment that usually produces balancing organ called halter is expanded into wing like structure okay so this is the four winged phenotype so don't count here uh, four because the two are cut to expose this so this four winged population came out in the same genetic stock when exposed to ether now what the scientists did is they chose the four winged ones and mated them and took the two winged ones even after ether exposure where they did not display the four winged phenotype those offspring they took and allowed them to develop uh, to adulthood and mated among themselves okay two winged one mated with two winged although they have experienced the earlier ether and the other one due to ether this four winged form came and it was mated with another four winged form when this was this sort of a genetic uh, crosses were set up over several generations after certain generation the four winged ones remained four winged ones even without that ether exposure okay and so how is this possible so it turns out that when they looked at the uh, bithorax uh, you know gene sequence itself they found that in the original stock there were actually four alleles that were present but these alleles did not cause the four winged phenotype only when an environmental cue uh, was there here being the exposed to ether some of these alleles produce the four wings so initially these four alleles were there in the population and in the absence of any selection or uh, they were all all equally there okay uh, th there was no need for one allele frequency to go down or one allele frequency to increase that will happen only there is a selection force so there was no selection force now when an environmental change ended up throwing the range of phenotype here being uh, let us say polyphenism having two alternative phenotypes two winged or four winged now when you are artificially selecting the four winged one then you have increased the frequency of four wing causing allele so that is how the genetic assimilation has happened so the uh, underlying al uh, genotype already existed just that that phenotype was not exposed and when the phenotype was exposed for that particular genotype and now there is a selection for this phenotype then it gets selected so this is what is genetic assimilation and this has been um, seen uh, in, um, in uh, tobacco moth as well so here you have um, a black mutant that uh, when it is heat shocked it can either not change the color or the larvae may change color little bit greener or some more green or really green so 
the one that does not respond at all to the heat you score 0 and the one that uh, responds to the other end of the range of the phenotype here a green you score 4. So, here this color is uh, assigned is, um, 0 and this one 3.5. So, now you select them and mate among them and then keep doing it over a period of multiple generations and what happens. So, here you have a situation where no selection is done this blue uh, graph. So, this x axis is the number of generations and the y axis is the at a given generation in that given population how many become uh, you know green how many become black and or whatever intermediate thing the score is uh, the score that we uh, assigned in the previous slide that is plotted in the y axis. So, only a certain fraction responds uh, to the color change in the unselected population, but when you select them like the one that scored high you mate among another one that scored high. If you keep repeating it then after certain generation many members of in them very readily change in response to the heat. While the one that you selected in the opposite direction where it scored low and I select it and mate among another one mate with another one that scored low and I keep repeating then eventually it becomes monophenic it is black all the time whether you heat shock or not heat shock. And here you end up seeing um, you know uh, the other end of the spectrum of the polyphenic uh, thing. So, this is selected one and at the 13th generation when people looked at uh, you know how well they respond the, like the phenotypic range possible for the environmental variation here the environmental variation being heat shock. So, that sort of a thing is what they call as reaction norm and when you look at this reaction uh, these graphs are called the reaction norms that is the phenotypic variation that is possible. This uh, selected one um, very readily uh, changes um, you know uh, to a larger extent when exposed to the heat shock like when it is reared 13th generation progeny when reared at temperature let us say around 28 uh, dramatically responds to uh, the heat shock change while the general population does not have that kind of a reaction norm and the other one selected against does not have any effect at all ok. Um, so, so the, 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 these are the uh, examples of how genetic assimilation happens. So, just like there how bithorax had multiple alleles and one allele we ended up selecting by doing this experiment. Similarly, here again it is to do with juvenile hormone production and we ended up selecting that. So, I am not getting into the details of that because that is not necessary for an introductory biology class. Uh, but the main point is that many phenotypic possibilities exist and when an environmental condition exposes the variations and if there is a selection pressure to select any of them and they get selected. Fine these are all experimental examples you are telling does it work in nature? The answer obviously is yes otherwise I would not have asked a question like this. Um, so, here is an example. So, this is a certain um, you know butterfly species. Uh, it has pig coloration pattern on the wings and this coloration pattern is temperature dependent. So, you can take the butterfly uh, population in a, let us say in a colder climate and you heat shock it and it produces variety of a, a variation in the coloring pattern. Now, you go to a, a warmer play uh, you know geography and then you look at the same species and you find the phenotype uh, uh, that you produced by heat shocking fly that was grown in colder environment and the opposite also has been found to be true. So, that is this example. So, the phenotype of a species ok that is characteristic of a geography is what is called ecotype. So, the same species in certain geography will have a certain phenotype in certain other geography will have a different phenotype. And these have obviously been selected by those geographical conditions ok. And uh, it, it works 
in situations where asymmetry is initially not uh, determined by the genotype. So, here is one good example, you look at this uh, fish, it is a flat fish okay. and it benefits by having both eyes on one side. So, during embryonic development one of the eyes moved over the skull to the other side to have both eyes on the top. So, this probably arose from an ancestral species where this asymmetry was not genetically determined and it, uh, it probably happened by random or due to an environmental cue ok and eventually then it got selected uh, probably because that fit its new adaptation ok in a new environment. And another good example is these lobsters, these lobsters uh, in, uh, in the juvenile stage they make the class the same way, both class are the same and if they do not have any hard objects to crush and break uh, then they, do, they develop symmetrically, but if they end up uh, uh, you know grabbing something with one of the claws and uh, used lot of effort in crushing and cracking then that creates an asymmetry and um, that becomes big. So, this is permitted by the genotype, again I want to highlight that point ok, the, the genotype enables this much flexibility and when a given environmental condition that gets selected and if that is uh, the fittest to that environment then that allele frequency changes ok. And so, th th this, this is how the environment can bring out the phenotypic possibilities of a given genotype ok. And this has is, uh, at least two uh, definitive advantages um, in evol evolutionary adaptation and that is explained here. When here you are not through random mutation, you are not experimenting to generate a phenotype that fits in an environment. You already have that phenotype in the population, which means it has not been uh, detrimental. So, it has already been tested and it is ok to be there. And now, when the environment changed, you could readily bring out that uh, variant of that given structure and it can readily adapt. So, this is actually preferable over newly generating a mutation and selecting. And another one a new mutation that may be um, uh, you know better for an environment will be one random monster that is not going to be in a population and it is going to take lot of generations before that a new mutation can actually be assimilated. But to survive in a given environment in a given generation if it is already there in multiple uh, members you know in large fraction of the population then many members actually can end up displaying the phenotype and there is a good chance of getting selected. So, so th 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 this is uh, th th this is why actually uh, you know uh, not, one should not only look at the uh, you know genetic uh, sequence itself, but we also need to look at the uh, developmental plasticity that allows these variations and therefore, how this could uh, help in developing. I, and to sum it all uh, what we actually end up understanding is um, this theory of change that is evolution is dependent on two pillars. Uh, one of them is population genetics where you identify and um, quantify the dynamics of these phenotypes that, that are there ok. Uh, but then you need another uh, pillar to support this that is the developmental mechanisms you know uh, a, a way to explain uh, how any specific mutation can actually become manifest so that uh, it is a selectable phenotype ok. And so, therefore, the, the, the mechanisms that construct the body is equally important along with population genetics to really help us understand evolution ok. So, with, with this uh, we end uh, not just this class, this course itself. So, I hope you guys um, really learnt uh, and developed a flavor for developmental biology.
and in due course some of you really uh, pick up this field for research and become famous developmental biologists. I wish you all the best.